Praise the Lord. Let's close our eyes for prayer. Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. We bless your name for your goodness. Thank you for your protection. Thank you for granting our journey mercies to be here. And thank you for all those who are listening in every location. Lord, we pray you speak to every heart tonight in Jesus' name. And we pray that your word will have the right impact in every heart. So that, Lord, you raise up your people to fulfill your will, obedient to your word, every time, in every way, in Jesus' name. Open our eyes of understanding tonight, so that we'll see and know what you want of us, what you require of us. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. We're back to First Thessalonians chapter 3. And today we're starting from verse 5 all through to verse 8. Open your Bible with me as we read. First Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 5. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I said to you know your faith. Lest by some means they tend to have tempted you and our labor be in vain. But now when Timothy, as Timothy, came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity that is your love, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all affliction and distress by your faith. For now, we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. Now we live, live happily and live joyfully and live purposefully on the condition that you stand fast in the faith, in grace, and in the Lord. Paul the Apostle had been concerned for the children of God in Thessalonica, and the concern was because he had been taken away from them. And when he was taken away from them, he didn't know that he had been staying so long before he came back to them. And he knew that the absence of the preacher, the absence of the pastor, the absence of the apostle, the absence of their leader could cause a great problem in their midst. And I began to think what might have happened unto them. Were they tempted already? Were they backsliding already? Were they still standing? And were they still holding on to the faith? That was the concern in the mind, in the heart of the apostle, the pastor of this church. That is of the church to the Thessalonians. And because of that, he had been thinking, wanting to go back to them a number of times, but he had not been able. And he began to think, is the devil doing something? Is the devil trying to destroy the work in Thessalonica? Because he's tried and tried to get there and he couldn't get there. And he began to wonder, what's the matter in this situation? Look at First Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 18, it says, Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Why is Satan closing the door? Why is he hindering us from getting back to that church we just planted? It's a new church. Although a vibrant church, a real converted church, a church that was following after the Lord, but then they needed help and counseling, and strengthening, and teaching, and training, and formation. And now Paul was not able to get there. Silas was not able to get there. Timothy was not able to get there. Because of that, he became concerned. That's why he said in verse 5 of chapter 3. Look at that again, chapter 3, verse 5. For this cause, for this reason, when I could no longer forbear, I've waited and waited, thinking I'll come back to you. I wasn't able to. I tried another way. I wasn't able to reach you. And he said, because of the concern I have, and because of what I thought might have happened unto you, therefore, he said, I now send Timothy unto you, so that I'll be able to know your condition. And he said, actually, you know what concerns me? He said, less by some means, in some ways, the tempter, 
Peter, I've tempted you and our neighbor be in vain. There are two things there. Number one, lest the tempter would have come to you and the tempter would have tempted you. Number two, if you then backslide because of the temptation and the trial from the tempter and the persecutors, our labor will be in vain. What will tempt people like that? Number one, their past life of, idol of idolatry could have tempted them. Look at First Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm looking at verse 9. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we urge unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. They were idol worshippers before, and now they have been converted. They had abandoned their idols and their charms and their regalias and all those magical evil things they were using before. And now if they had problems and the apostle was not there to pray for them, if they had problems and the pastors and the teachers were not there, to counsel them. He was thinking, would it be that they have come back to their idol worship and to their occultism? That was one thing that concerned him. That's why he said, even though I cannot come to them, I'm going to send Timothy unto them. Another thing that could be a problem is uh, the old unconverted associate. You know that sinners are everybody has associates, acquaintances, and friends. And these Thessalonians became converted. And some of their friends were not converted. Some of their friends were not born again. And Paul the apostle became concerned that those old associates and old friends might have tricked them and tricked them and deceived them and make them to backslide. Look at chapter 2 of 4 Thessalonians. And I'm reading from verse 14. For ye brethren became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea and I in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, their own countrymen, their past old associates that are, were not converted. They could be a source of temptation. A source of trial, a source of deception for them. And because of that, Paul the Apostle became concerned that those old associates could pull them back into evil, back into sin. And so Paul said, I'm concerned about you. I'm worried about you. Are you still standing or you are falling? Are you still standing or you have, or you have yielded to the temptation coming from your old associates? I'm asking you the same thing since you were born again. And since you gave your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, your past life of idol worship, has that dragged you back? Your past life of immorality, has that drawn you back? And your past old associates, have they succeeded in putting pressure upon you to get your back into the place of the world? Number three, the flesh could have tempted them and the flesh the lust of the flesh and the pride of life could have deceived them and they could have come back away from the Lord that's why Paul the apostle became concerned about them in first John chapter 3 chapter 2 first John chapter 2 I'm reading from verse 15 love not the world now that the things that are in the world, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in it. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. That's the concern of Paul the Apostle, that the lust of the flesh and the lust of, of the eyes and the pride of life those worldly things that make people proud and pompous and want to show off what they have and what they don't have. He said that might have tempted them. And so he became concerned for this church because if they yielded to temptation, the work of the apostle, the work of the pastor, the work of their leaders would have been in vain. He said, I'm thinking about you every time I wanted to come back to you myself and see you and know where you are, and where you stand. And because I couldn't do that, I'm sending Timothy unto you. And there was another serious problem that had actually happened. And you need to think about this. One of the associates of Paul the Apostle, one of the preachers, one of the assistants of Paul the Apostle, one of the full-time workers with Paul the Apostle was a man called Demas. 
But that full time worker had backslid him and had gone away from Paul the apostle. And guess where he went? He went to Thessalonica. And then Paul said, Hey, that man has gone. He's backsliding. He has loved this present world and he's gone to Thessalonica. How do I know what he's going to do there? That's why Paul the apostle became concerned for those people in Thessalonica. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 10. 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're looking at verse 10. For demons has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. That was a great concern for Paul the Apostle, that that man that knew the in and out of Paul the Apostle, knew all the doctrines of Paul the Apostle, and knew all the trips of Paul the Apostle, and knew all that Paul the Apostle had done in Thessalonica. And he didn't find any other place to go when he backslid. When he departed from Paul the Apostle, he went to Thessalonica. And so Paul the Apostle became concerned and said, hey, brethren, Thessalonica, somebody is there. He's coming to you. I want you to understand whatever he says. It's not standing for me. It's not standing with me. He's come back into the world and he's there in Thessalonica. And I'm concerned about you that you'll not listen to backsliding preachers like that. That's the reason they became concerned. Come back to 4, 7, chapter 3. I'm looking at verse 5 again for this cause. When I could no longer forbear, I said, it is urgent now. I need to say something. I need to do something. I need to get to these Thessalonians. Lest this man Demas will trip them and trick them and deceive them and then pull them back into sin and into evil. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith. Lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. Another reason I was concerned is because that devil that had been hindering him from going to Thessalonians could go there to tempt the people and make them backslide and make them forsake the Lord. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I'm looking at verse 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Looking at verse 3, but I fear lest by any means, as a serpent beguiled Eve, through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that, that is in Christ. He said, I became concerned that as a serpent went to the garden of Eden, a beautiful garden, a wonderful garden, and I got made for Adam and Eve, and they were enjoying all the provisions of the Lord there. The serpent went there, beguiled them, deceived them, and brought them back into it, and brought them into evil. And Paul, the apostle said, I'm concerned also concerning you because the devil, Satan, that evil one, he might have come to you as he went to the garden of Eden to pollute your mind and to cast doubt in your mind. God doesn't love you and God doesn't want you to see and to have everything you ought to have. That's why he's keeping this away from you. And Paul, the apostle is representative. He doesn't love you. That's why he has not come back unto you. Paul the apostle was concerned about that. And so he said, I'm now sending Timothy to you. Even though I cannot come now, I need to know your state. I need to know your faith. I need to know whether you're standing. I need to know whether you're still holding fast onto the faith. And if you're holding fast to the faith, then we'll rejoice and we'll live. And we'll live purposefully. Another reason is because he knew that it is possible that immorality could have come back. Because, you know, those Thessalonians, uh, anywhere you find idolatry, you also find adultery. In those olden days, in the days of the New Testament, all those cities, they were given to idolatry as well as idolatry. Because two of them, they go together, idolatry and adultery. Adultery and idolatry. And because they were idol worshippers before, and that's why you find Paul the Apostle writing to the Romans, mentions fornication, writing to the Corinthians, mentions fornication, writing to the Galatians, mentions fornication, writing to everybody. Philippians and uh, Colossians and Ephesians, Mention fornication every time and adultery. It was a common thing at that time. And Paul the Apostle was very much concerned with those new converts that their problem was number one, idol worship. And then number two, uh, uh, adultery and fornication. That's why I wrote to them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Look at verse 3 there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 3. But this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. 
communication. It was a great problem in Thessalonica. In fact, they, told, they have told us in history that they built their houses and then on the walls of their houses you have pornographic pictures and it was almost everywhere. And Paul, the apostle, became concerned. This thing that is rampant. And this time that makes the whole land dirty, smelling, spiritually smelling. As it caught up with those eternal believers, that's why I sent Timothy to them said, go and find out. Are they now back in the flesh and back in idol worship and back in idolatry and back in fornication, back in uh, immorality? Go check up. And then when Timothy came back and said, those people are standing. They're standing in righteousness. They're standing in godliness. They're standing in, in grace. How happy he was. That's why I said, for now we live. Because you're standing, standing in the Lord and standing in the faith. That's another thing that concerned him. The Paul the Apostle knew very well that the absence of a leader could actually generate problem in the congregation. Because he knew, if you look at Exodus chapter 32, Exodus chapter 32, I'm reading from verse 1. The absence of a pastor, the absence of an apostle, and the absence of a church planter could actually make the people so discouraged to say, well, Moses is not around, the apostle is not around, the pastor is not around. What are we going to do now? Why are we still standing? Why are we still resisting temptation? And Paul, the apostle, knew that, that the absence of the leader, the absence of the pastor, and the absence of the apostle could actually mean a real terrible problem for them. Exodus chapter 32, I'm looking at verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, oh, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, or what not, we know not what is become of him. And that was a concern, the heart of the Paul the Apostle, that because he had been absent, because he had not been with them, he didn't know what had happened to them spiritually. Because the enemy normally takes advantage of the absence of leadership of the absence of our coordinators, of the absence of our group coordinators, and sometimes the absence of the pastor himself, that the devil then begins to work havoc. I can't see the pastor, I can't see our leader, so why am I still standing? And then temptation will come, and then you yield to temptation because of that absence. Look at Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, I'm reading there from verse 25. Matthew chapter 13, verse 25. But while men slept, his enemy came and so tears among the wheat and went his way. While men slept, that is when the leaders are absent, you think they've gone to sleep. And because they are not there, they are not vigilant, they are not looking at our lives and teaching us and helping us and developing us and encouraging us and counseling us. They are absent. When men slept, the enemy came and then so tears in the field. That was the concern of Paul the Apostle. Come back to First Thessalonians chapter 3. First Thessalonians chapter 3, he was concerned for these believers, lest the enemy would have gotten them and then they were back into their vomit. Look at chapter, chapter 3, chapter 3 verse 5, for this cause. When I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. Look at that part. Lest some tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. He said, lest I bestow labor upon you in vain. He was very much concerned that his labor will not be in vain. There are people that do evangelism, they just evangelize. They don't think whether the work is fruitful or not, whether the converts are abiding or not, whether we're staying or not. Their work is in vain, but they don't understand. And there's nothing to be rewarded for in eternity. But Paul, the apostle, was very much concerned that his work will not be in vain. And I pray that our own evangelism will not be in vain. That everything as we are working for the Lord and laboring in the kingdom, that we'll be able to have abiding fruit that remains so that we'll be rewarded on the final day. Galatians chapter 4 verse 11. 
Galatians chapter 4, I'm looking at verse 11. I am afraid of you, lest I bestowed upon you labor in vain. That's Paul the Apostle talking to the Galatians. He said, I'm afraid of you, the way you're acting, the way you're living, and the way you're listening to almost every voice coming to town, and the way you're being swayed from the real gospel. I'm afraid of you, lest I bestowed labor upon you in vain. In Philippians chapter 2, I'm looking at verse 16. Philippians chapter 2. Verse 16, is telling us here, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Do you ever think about that, your service, that will not be in vain, your evangelism? That will not be in vain your sacrifice. That will not be in vain your teaching. That will not be in vain. And your labor over the household of faith in the house fellowship or in the zone or in the group or in the district or in the local church. That your work will not be in vain. Are you careful or are you careless? Are you just doing the work you do and then you don't mind whether it is bearing fruit or not? In the case of Paul the Apostle, he said, I'm very mindful that what I'm doing, the preaching I'm doing, the ministry I'm engaged in will not be in vain. It was so much concerned that it will not labor in the fire and for the fire. In Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 13, there are people that are laboring for the fire. That is, their work will be burnt, but they don't mind. They don't understand that it's very important to watch so that your ministry, your work, your life, your sacrifice, everything you've done will not be for the fire. In Habakkuk chapter 2, we're looking at verse 13. There are people that labor for the fire. There are people that labor in the fire. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 13. Behold, is it not of the Lord? And of the host that the people shall labor in the very fire, that the people shall labor in the very fire, labor in the fire, and then their work eventually is burnt. I pray that will not be your Lord in Jesus' name. So Paul the Apostle was occupied in ministry, and his labor was selfless, his labor was spiritual and sacrificial, and sometimes he was even a tent maker, and he'll build tents to maintain himself and labor with his sons night and day, so that he'll not be chargeable unto them. But even with all that sacrificial labor, he said he was very careful, and he constantly avoided laboring in vain. And he said, yes, we labor, but we want to be accepted of the Lord. He said we're preaching so that we can present every man perfect in the sight of the Lord. So that when the Lord shall come, the fruit of what he has done will not all be wasted. I pray that your work will not be wasted. But you know, if you are not careful, if you are not watchful, if you just labor anyhow, and then just leave the work over there, eventually because you are not watching, and you are not laboring for eternity, and you are not thinking of the fruit abiding, Eventually, if you are not careful, the labor could be in vain. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28 and verse 29. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. Who will preach? Warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That's how your labor will not be in vain. That everything you do in ministry, every evangelism you do, Every teaching that you do, every conservation of the fruit that you get involved in, every discipleship that you get involved in, you want to perfect the people, mature the people, complete the people, so that your work will not be in vain. Wherefore, I also labor, striving according to, the, to his working, which worketh in me mightily. We're looking at Colossians chapter 4 verse 12. We we'll see another minister here, Paphras, the way he labored and the reason he labored and then the objective and the purpose and the goal of his labor. Colossians chapter 4 verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. The commitment of Paul the Apostle was not just to preach, but he preached that souls might be saved. His commitment, his concern was not just to labor, 
and to bring forth children. But he labored wisely to preserve the converts in the faith unto life eternal. In the province of Galatia, in that of Philippi and Thessalonica, and every other place that he went, he cared for, he taught, and he developed, and he built up his converts. He did not leave the converts in the hands of strangers or false prophets, and he would not bring forth his children for the murderers of souls. Very careful that those people will be preserved. That's why we are careful in this church, children of us who are your pastors and your leaders and your coordinators who are careful that the work we do will be preserved to eternity and you will stand to eternity in Jesus' name. That those who are saved will remain saved. That those who are sanctified will remain sanctified. And those who are filled with the Holy Ghost will remain energized, empowered, emulated, and empowered, and the Spirit of God in Jesus' name. So that when the role is called up yonder, all our converts and all our members will be together at the feet of the Lord in Jesus' name. As we look at the story today, we're going to divide to three parts. Number one, caution against eternal loss and laboring in vain. Caution against eternal loss and laboring in vain. That speaks to every believer that you'll be cautious, you'll be very careful that you're not lost eventually and you don't labor in vain. That speaks to every worker, that speaks to every preacher, that speaks to every evangelist, that speaks to every person traveling about and doing this and doing that here. It's not just what you do, it's how that work abides. Caution against eternal loss and laboring in vain. Number two, comfort through established love and lasting virtues. You can see from these Thessalonians, they, they remembered Paul. They loved Paul. They had affection for Paul, just like Paul had for them. And what a great comfort that brought in the heart of the apostle. Number three, commitment to exceptional labors while living victoriously. Labor and life, life and labor. You are living victoriously and then you are laboring tirelessly. Those two things are joined together. Let's come to number one. Caution against eternal laws and laboring in vain. We'll see coming back to this now in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 5. So much in this verse. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 5. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I say to know your faith. Lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. You'll see what the apostle was concerned about here. He knew that somebody could labor in vain and he said, I will not labor in vain. Number two, he knew that somebody could preach in vain and he said, I'll not preach in vain. You know, somebody can preach, you know, almost every day of the year. And yet, it's just preaching and preaching and preaching. He doesn't know the effect of that preaching, the result of that preaching, the fruit. That preaching is bearing. It's not having any impact on anybody, but just goes on preaching. He doesn't examine whether the preaching is right or not, whether the people have been affected or not, just loves to preach. But it's in vain when it doesn't transform life, when it doesn't change negative destiny to become positive when it doesn't grow up the believers when it doesn't mature the believers that will be preaching in vain number three somebody could teach in vain and paul the apostle said i preach and i teach i teach and i preach but he wanted to make sure that the ministry the laboring the preaching the teaching was not in vain number four evangelizing in vain there are people that just travel around and they go here they go there and then they make a lot of noise and they gather this together, they gather that together, and no convert stays, no convert abides, no convert remains. They, they just love to go around evangelizing, traveling all about. Maybe it's, uh, you know, traveling they love. It's not the real work that they love. But the Lord is saying, let's be wise. If the evangelism is not bearing for, come back and sit down and evaluate again. How do you do it so that the result of the evangelism will stay and abide? But Paul the Apostle said, yes, I evangelize, but I will not evangelize in vain. Then worshiping in vain. There are some people that just worship, whether God accepts the worship or not, whether that worship is audible or not, whether that worship is according to scripture or not. They don't worry, they just worship. But the Paul the Apostle is saying, I will not worship in vain. Number five, there are some people that pray and fast, but us in vain. 
They pray and fast. What result is he bringing? I just fast. They fast every, every, every week. They fast maybe one day, they two days in the week. But does he generate any result? Is he bringing any fruit? They don't know. They just love to pray and fast. And we're saying, come back and see them and evaluate the result of the praying and the fasting so that you're not praying and fasting in vain. Other people work miracles in vain. Miracles in vain. They work miracles. They go here, they open the eyes of the blind. They go over here, they make the limb to walk. They go over there. They just love to work miracles. And then finally, the Lord will tell them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that walk iniquity, living in sin and trying to work miracles. Walking miracles in vain. Other people, they suffer in vain. I pray you will not suffer in vain. Uh, look, at, look at this in uh, Galatians chapter 3 verse 4. Galatians chapter 3. I'm looking at verse 4 there. Have you suffered so many things in vain? If it be yet in vain. The Galatians had suffered and then Paul, the apostle, was telling them the way you are going and the things you are doing, all the suffering, all the pain, all the persecution could be in vain. And he said, have you suffered so many things in vain? Some people suffer in vain. And that's why the Lord is cautioning us and the Lord is telling us that whatever labor, whatever teaching, whatever preaching, whatever evangelization, and whatever fasting and prayer, whatever worship, whatever suffering or sacrifice, make sure it is not in vain. Why? Because our work will be tested on that final day. It will be tested by fire. And if your work does not abide the fire, does not go through the fire and remain, then you are going to lose everything and it's going to be a labor in vain. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 13. For every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try and test every man's work of what sort it is. The Lord is telling us here through the Apostle Paul that the work we do, the service we render, the preaching we make, and the teaching that we give, everything eventually will be tested by fire. And the converse will say we have, the fruits will say we have, everything will be tested by fire. It says in verse 14, if any man's work abide which he has built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burnt, he shall suffer loss. If any man's work shall be burnt, he shall suffer loss. That means then that there'll be no fruit remaining. There'll be no result. There'll be nothing to reward him for. And it will be that such a person has been unwise. We're told, look at this illustration in Job chapter 39. Job chapter 39. I'm reading from verse 13 there. Job 39 verse 13. And we need to be very thoughtful. You know, you come to Bible study every time. I pray that your coming will not be in vain. You know, we'll study the Bible and read the Bible. And I, I'm just praying that reading the Bible, you know, we do it in our church here. We go from chapter to chapter in our Bible reading time before we preach. And then after, you know, we do that on Sunday, we do that on Monday. And we're just going through Old Testament and New Testament. And then you're asking yourself, what's the effect of that Bible reading in your life, in your family, in your ministry? You know the Bible so much, but will it be in vain? We we'll study the Bible from, uh, you know, book to book, like we're now in First Thessalonians. And the study, what impact is it making in your life? So that it doesn't appear on the final day that you studied in vain and worshipped in vain. I pray that will not happen to you. Job chapter 39 verse 13 tells us, Givest thou the goodly wings unto the peacocks, or, the, or wings and feathers unto the ostrich? It's talking about these birds that look beautiful, just awesome, wonderful. You have to look at their feathers, but it says, Which leaveth her eggs in the earth, and warmeth them in the dust, and forgetteth that the food may crush them, or that the wild bees may break them. She is hiding against her young ones, as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without fear, because God has deprived her of wisdom, neither has imparted unto her understanding. It says those birds are beautiful to look at. 
But when they lay their eggs, they just leave them in the doors. And they do not understand that wild animals can come and tread upon them. Or men may come and tread upon them and break them. And so their labor will be in vain. And their young ones, they, they bring out the young ones. And when the young ones are there, they're not caring. And they're not brooding over them. They're not watching over them. And it's like their hearts are hardened against their young, against their converse. And it says, when they are lost, they don't even know. Because they do not have the wisdom. God deprived them of wisdom, neither a sin imparted unto them understanding. And if you are like that, that you are bringing up converts, you never watch over them, never keep them. And the Lord is saying, you are like that beautiful animal. The, be the feathers are beautiful. And the look is beautiful, but no wisdom to be able to preserve the young ones that she brought into the world. And one will become like brutes, like animals. And the Lord is saying, don't you have wisdom? Don't you examine your work? Don't you think about eternity? Don't you labor for the time to come? Don't you think about your future and what you are going to have as reward? There are some of us that have left house, we have left land, we have left everything in life. And we say we're working for the Lord. We're on here, we're on there. And if we don't think about what we do, just a running. You can run in vain. Just a preaching. You can preach in vain. You know, some of us will labor in the day and labor in the night. And some of us will labor almost every day of the week. We'll preach here, we'll preach there, but we're not sitting back to say, what's the fruit of what I'm doing? What's the fruit of this evangelism? What's the fruit of all this traveling? What's the fruit of all this preaching? What's the fruit of all this sweating? And then you wake up in eternity and then you become empty-handed. There is no fruit at all. You say, where are the people? I live on every day. The Lord said, you didn't sit back to think. Think about your future. And think about your life, the way your life is going. It's not just they're inviting me here, they're inviting me there, they're inviting me everywhere. And because the invitations are coming, I'm running there. If you're on there just to meet up with the invitation, what will the result be in eternity? Think about that. That's why the Lord is telling us the soil will not labor in vain. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah chapter 49. I'm reading verse 4. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. It, well, it's good for even this man saying this while he was still alive. What if he did not think about that while he was still alive? And then I'm talking to you who are listening to me that the work you do for the Lord, is it in vain? Do you just, just do it? I don't think about the result, whether it's going to be rewarded in the final, on the final day or not. Or whether the fire is going to burn everything. He said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord and my work with my God. We're looking at Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Paul the apostle was always concerned. He mentioned this in Philippi. He mentioned this in, in the prophet of Galatia. He mentioned this to Thessalonians. I don't want to labor in vain. I'm checking up. I'm examining it so that the fruit will be abiding. Galatians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 11. I'm afraid of you. Lest I bestowed upon you labor in vain. By the way, why did he say that? Look at chapter 1. Chapter 1. We're looking at it from verse 6. The reason he was concerned about the Galatians, he touched them the gospel, he preached the gospel to them. Many of them said they would give their lives to the Lord. They were born again. But then some other people came to town. Deceivers came to town. False prophets came to town. Preachers of the false gospel, perverted gospel came to town. And they just took what they preached. And Paul, the apostle was saying, what's the matter with you? You want me to labor in vain over you? Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. I marvel that he has also removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we are preaching unto you, let him be what? Let him be a curse. You know why Paul the apostle was saying that? I told you already that... Uh, Demas was one of his associates, one of his partners. 
One of the preachers had labored along with him, but then he eventually loved the things of the world, the gold and the silver, the worldliness, the evil things, conventional things came into his heart. A spirit of deception took over the life of demons. And now he left Paul, the apostle, went to the sniper. And when he got there, what do you think he'll be doing? People knew him before. Say, hey, why are you here? How about Paul? Paul is not here. You are here. What are you doing here? Are you no more with him? Then they'll begin to tell stories and begin to tell them a perverted gospel. Oh, Paul, I've let that Paul... Because that Paul is, you know, is fanatical. I've left that Paul. I cannot go by the peace of that Paul. You know, he was all heavenly minded, heaven, heaven, heaven all the time. And because he knew that such people might go to this place, said, they come to you and they preach another gospel, a perverted gospel to deceive you and to make you go astray. He said, it's not another it's a perverted gospel. And it said, though we or an angel from heaven, any of our associates that was with us before, come to you and preach any other gospel unto you than that which we are preached, let him be a cause. Look at verse 9. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be, tell me again, a curse. Yeah, that, it was so serious. It, that's because he didn't want to preach in vain. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 1. We then as workers together with him beseech you also that she receive not the grace of God in vain. We beseech you. We plead with you. We beg you that you will not receive the grace of God in in vain. Because there were people that were receiving the grace of God and you couldn't see the evidence of that grace in their lives. No matter when we have grace, it brings salvation. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present age, in this present world. There are some people, they say they have the grace. There's no godliness in their lives, no righteousness in their lives. That's why he said that you do not receive the grace of God in vain. When we receive the grace of God and it's not in vain, it will be a fruit in our lives. It will be a fruit in your life. In Philippians chapter 2, I'm looking at verse 16. Philippians chapter 2, verse 16. Yeah, it says, holding, holding forth the word of life. Time of temptation, hold that word of life forth. And a time of trial, hold forth that word of life. In a time when people are trying to discourage you and persuade you to go away from the Lord, you hold forth the word of life, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and the service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all for the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. It says as long as you are holding that word forth and you are not deceived by any means by anyone and I know that you are standing on the basis of that word and the foundation of that word I'll keep on rejoicing and I hope that you too you rejoice along with me. Mark chapter 7 in Mark chapter 7, uh, we look at what, uh, you know, the Pharisees were doing that actually made them to serve in vain or to labor in vain. Mark chapter 7, looking at verse 7. Abit, in vain do they worship me. They, they thought they were worshiping God. In vain do they worship me. Have you found some people today that they say they concentrate on worship, worship, worship. And, you know, immorality comes in and licentious things uh, come in because in their worship, uh, they, you know, rejoice in kissing one another and embracing one another and men and women kind of uh, doing some bad, bad things. And they say it's part of their worship. They, that's just how they show their own love to one another. They say, well, you church, uh, they mention you know, our church in particular, you concentrate on studying the Bible, holiness, holiness, preaching, evangelism. We, our special is worship and then the worship degenerates into immorality into sensuality in the, you know the worship degenerates into just a fellow feeling to one another and their hearts are filled with immoral things and the Lord is saying your worship but it's in vain I pray you'll not be like that 
You know, sometimes people, they come to our church for the first time. Maybe they are coming from places where, you know, they worship all one another, kiss one another and dance and jump and everything and, you know, spin and all that. And they say, well, but the church over here is too quiet. That's the kind of worship God loves or worship in spirit, not in the flesh. Give me a good amen. Amen. And so, if you love that kind of worship, that will bring immorality in your heart, in your mind, bad thoughts, evil thoughts, adulterous thoughts, that's terrible. Because that is the kind of worship that's going to be in vain. I pray that your worship will not be in vain. How be it in vain do they worship me? Teach him for doctrine, the commandments of men. Those who teach, and they're teaching only the commandments of men, and they're not teaching the word of God. They're teaching what men like to hear, what will suit the flesh. The Lord says you are teaching in vain. Let's come to point number two now. Comfort through established love and lasting virtues. Comfort through established love and lasting virtues. We're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. But now, when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our afflictions and distress by your faith. As you look at those uh, verses, if you don't understand, you'll think that the apostle was becoming sentimental. You think the apostle was feeling lonely. You know, people who are lonely, that's the way they talk. They say, you know, when I didn't see you, I felt so lonely. I didn't even know I could eat. I lost my appetite because I couldn't see you. That's loneliness. Paul the apostle was not talking of something like that. Paul the apostle was saying that you have not loved false doctrine. You still love those of us who preach sound doctrine unto you. And you still accepted the totality of the word of God. And you are keeping what you've got. And you want me to come back and preach the same thing unto you. And because you are standing with sound doctrine. And you love sound doctrine. And you know that any time I come, I'll straighten things out to perfect you, to mold you, and to mature you. And you, and you want to see me so that I can come and perfect whatever I lacking in your faith. I'm so happy that you deserve sound doctrine and that you love the preacher of sound doctrine and you give your heart and your mind to sound doctrine and that the way I want to see you to come and impart it unto you. You also want me to see you so that I can impart it unto you. That desire for the truth and for the preachers of the truth makes me glad and makes me rejoice. And so Paul the Apostle is not talking about you know people who just say I want to see those uh, people because when I see them all my loneliness will go when I see them then I will feel happy I will know that I still have friends I will know that I still have people that appreciate no not at all that's not Paul the apostle he was a real man of God and what gave him joy was the very fact that the people wanted the word of God and they wanted him to come and still lay line upon line and precept upon precept concerning the word of God and that's what gives us joy when you say, we want the pastor to come so that he can teach us the word of God. And every time we're going to have Bible study and it comes to your turn to come over here, then you are running. And then, you know, we see you fill up the hall. We say we're happy not because we just see your face. It's not your face. It's your heart. It's your desire. It's your willingness to receive the word of God. That's what gives us joy. Not just your facial appearance. The face means nothing. Just like the Bible says, beauty is vain. But it's a heart that desires the word of God. And thank God you desire the word of God. And you want to soak in and sink in the word of God. That will affect your life, affect your character, affect every part of you. That is the joy we have. And I pray that joy will never be taken away from us in Jesus' name. He said, we are comforted because we see that you love the truth. You want the truth. Even when the word of God is coming to you with correction. Even when the word of God is coming to you with cleansing. And is purging you. You love it. That gives us joy and comfort. Second Corinthians chapter. Chapter 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. Great is my boldness of speech towards you. 
Great is my glory of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. Why? For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. But we were troubled on every side without our fightings and within our fears. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. You see that? Paul the apostle said when I was in Corinth to the Corinthians, he said, I was cast down. I was unhappy. I was feeling, oh, what's happening to those Corinthian believers? Are they still standing? And then you said, then Titus came and he gave me some good news concerning you. Because you know, in First Corinthians, he had written a very serious letter to them. He corrected them, he rebuked them, he chastised them, he laid the rod of correction, discipline upon them. And he said, that fellow that committed multi in chapter 5, cast that fellow out. Disfellowship him, excommunicate him. Don't let him step into the church again. He said, what have I to do? Judging the people outside, the people that are inside the church, I must discipline and they must not remain in sin. And he thought that that kind of a firm stand and discipline will make the Corinthians say, oh, look at this Paul. We don't want him anymore. Don't come and preach to us anymore because you're too firm and you're too strict. But Titus came back in 2 Corinthians and he said, Paul, you know what? That correction, they accepted it. That correction, they loved it. Even the excommunication of that sinner, of that terrible backslider that went into a multi with his father's wife, they loved it. Look at what he says in verse 7. And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. For though I made you sorry with a letter, that's the first Corinthians that he wrote to them, I do not regret, I do not repent, I do not relent. Then he said, though I did relent, and though I did feel sorry, for I, I perceive that the same epistle that made you sorry, though it were but for a season, now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that ye sorrow to repentance, for ye were made sorry at a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. He's talking about what the discipline he gave out to that uh, terrible backslider. He said, now I rejoice because of your attitude. Look at verse 10, for godly sorrow walketh repentance to salvation, not to be regretted of, but the sorrow of the world walketh death. For behold, the self same thing that ye sorrowed at a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, ye, what clearing of yourselves, ye, what indignation, ye, what fear, ye, what vehement desire, ye, what zeal, what revenge in all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. That is the way the Corinthians received the discipline of that individual. Paul the Apostle said, I rejoice that you are standing. I rejoice that you love the truth. And that now you are not siding in with backsliders and with unbelievers. That makes me rejoice. And then he said, now you have cleared yourself that you are not a partaker of evil. Look at verse 12. Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did, I did it not for the cause that, uh, and for he that had done the wrong, nor for, the co for his cause that suffered the wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. Therefore, we were comforted in your comfort, yea, and exceedingly the more joyed we for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. I pray our church will be like this. When somebody has committed sin and the fellow is disciplined, either in the district or in the group or in the central church, that will not side in with sinners, with backsliders who want to destroy the souls of people to pull them to hell, but will take sides of the word of God and rejoice together that the church remains pure, that our church remains clean, that our church remains holy. We're not going to throw away the church because of one individual. I'm not going to throw away at the doctrine of righteousness, holiness, and sanctification because of one individual. 
we rather throw away one person and preserve the spiritual life of multitudes of people. And I pray that you remain on that right track forever in Jesus' name. We are looking at, we are looking at a first, uh, we are looking at uh, Philippians chapter 1, the first chapter of Philippians chapter 1. And I'm reading there from verse 27, that at all times in all things, we remain faithful to the word, committed to the word. For Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, only let your conversation be as it becomes the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your fears, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together in the faith of the gospel. That's what brings joy to the preacher. What brings joy to the pastor? What brings joy to the apostle? That we're all standing fast with the same mind, holding on to the same faith, and defending the same gospel, and living by that same standard of the word of God. Well, we thank God that today it is like that, and I pray it will always be like that. Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, what brings joy to the heart of the preacher? What brings joy to the heart of your pastor? What brings joy to the heart of the apostle Paul? Colossians chapter 3 verse 12. Put on therefore as elect of God, holy and beloved, by words of mercy, kindness, for humbleness of mind, and meekness, and long suffering. It says, whatever the suffering and whatever the trial, whatever the pressure, keep on standing in the faith. In verse 13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man has a quarrel against any, he's talking of brother to brother, sister to sister, member to member, that if there's any offense in any personal way, your neighborhood, in the community, forgive one another. Even as Christ for, forgive you, as so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye also are called in one body and be ye thankful and let the word of Christ dwell in you how richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing singing how with grace in your heart unto the Lord. And then in verse 17, very important, look at verse 17. Whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Look at, now we're going to verse 8. We're looking at, at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, we're looking at verse 8. First Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 8. It tells us, for now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Paul the apostle told the Thessalonian believers, he said, you know what? We live, we live joyfully, we live purposefully, and we live excitedly. If you will stand fast and remain firm in the faith, for now we live if you stand fast in the faith, the steadfastness of their faith and love and appreciation brought new encouragement and excitement and spiritual energy to Paul's life. The life we are talking about does not just merely consist in natural existence, but in doing something that makes life worth living. Living is not merely breathing, but doing and enjoying what God has appointed life to accomplish. What constituted Paul's life was laboring and loving and leading and teaching and preaching and evangelizing and winning souls unto life eternal. Knowing that the Thessalonian believers retained the life of faith in Christ and knowing that they had the life of grace and knowing that they had the life of godliness and holiness and the life that leads to eternal glory despite the afflictions and persecutions, give him comfort and more courage to live purposefully. The same affirm, the same thing that Paul has affirmed is true of all the faithful ministers of the gospel. They feel that they have something to live for and something real that is worth living for when the people they are preaching to stand in grace, they are steadfast and in faith and they are consistent in the life of holiness before the Lord. I want you to look at that verse again in just chapter 3 verse 8. For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. That little word if. 
that little word a very important very significant in fact you're going to find that word all through the bible from genesis revelation let me just give you a few verses where we'll find that if it's a condition if you do this then this will happen if you are standing fast, then we're going to keep on living purposefully. And he's saying that we we'll live in the service of the Lord. We we'll live in the worship of the Lord. We we'll live in all the excitement of worship and sacrifice. If you keep on standing, the implication is if you don't keep on standing, uh, the excitement will come to those who are preaching. And they will not be able to come to you and preach the word until they will say, after all, what's, what's the result of the other one we did? What's the result of the other place we went? It will not give us excitement and enthusiasm and joy and, you know, just moving on. When you are not standing, I pray you will stand. Amen. I said you will stand. Uh, you know, when a mother, when a mother delivers a child and that child is growing well, is doing well, is, you know, nice and is loving and all that, that mother would want to have another child. But, you know, if uh, you have three children and those three children are just a hell on earth for you, a son in the flesh for you. And then somebody says, I'm going to have a fourth child. <laughs> I'm thinking about it because these three, they are enough to even make life miserable for a mother. But if those three children, if they're wonderful, and if they're walking according to the way that the parents are teaching them, and things are according to the will of God, you're excited. If children are like this, we shall have a multitude of them. And that's what the pastor is thinking. If the church is like this, saved and sanctified and obedient and holy and righteous and soft in their heart and following the Lord and receiving the word, obedient to the word as you are teaching them, the pastor will be very happy and excited. He wants to plant another church there because there's a good church in Salonika, another church in Philippi, another church in Colossae, and those churches are doing great and they're doing wonderful. There'll be excitement to come to come and to want to do the word of to do the work of God and to move on. And thank God, thank God for people like you. I say thank God for people like you. If all the churches are just like this, we're excited, we're going to keep on preaching. And with your prayer, with your cooperation, it will be like that in Jesus' name. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. And then let's move around and look at that word if. We're looking at John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And I'm reading from verse 30. We're looking for the word if, if. John chapter 8, verse 13. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews who believed on him. If, that's the word, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. That's the condition that you continue. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples. Let's look at, let's look at chapter 15. John chapter 15. I'm reading there from verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. If, if, um, I am, I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth fruit. And for without me, ye can do nothing. Look at verse six. What's the first word there? If a man abide not in me, look at that condition. If a man, he said, I'm saved. I'm born again. I'm a new creature in Christ. I'm a member of the body of Christ. I'm a member of, a member of the church. And he does not abide in the word of God. He strays away. He goes away into false doctrine. He goes away into immorality and fornication and adultery. He goes away into covetousness and stealing. He goes away into things that are evil. And he says, I'm a child of God. I'm born again. I pray. I see vision. If a man abides not in me, he's cast forth as a branch. And he's withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire. And they are burnt. If, verse 7, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Romans chapter 11, verse 22. Romans chapter 11. We're looking at verse 22. Romans 11 verse 22. Behold therefore the goodness and the severity of God on them which fell severity but toward the goodness if thou continue. You see that? If thou continue. And there are some people, their salvation is uh, old time 
a cake ancient past salvation. 19 such and such, I was saved. Stop telling story. Tell me about what's happening today. You have the grace of God today. Are you standing in righteousness and holiness today? Story, story, story. I was saved 2000 and something. That story, I'm asking about the grace of God today. Your faith in Christ today. You're standing today. Your clean and righteous, holy life today. Your submission to the word of God today. Your obedience to the word of God today. That's what matters. It's not story about, you know, in the past I was saved. I raised up my hand. That's wonderful. Tell me about your present day experience in Christ. Look at verse 22 again. Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God. On them which fell severity, that's severe judgment, but toward the goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. I pray you will not be cut off. And let's look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 21, Colossians chapter 1. We're reading from verse 21. If you continue, if you abide, if you stay, if you remain. Colossians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 21. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked words, yet now as he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you how? holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight if ye continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel if you are not kind the kind of person that a little wind is blowing and you are blown off a little difficulty a little challenge a little pressure a little persecution then you have gone but it says, if you remain, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and you are not moved away from the hope of the gospel. We're looking at um, 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 10. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they also may obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful sin. For if we be dead with him. We shall also live with him. Verse 12. Tell me the first word. If if we suffer, we, if we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. If we deny him, what will he do? He also will deny us. You know, somebody say, I was saved, I was saved. And now your people are bringing idolatry, idol worship. And I say, you don't have any child yet. If you use this one and use this one, then you have children. And then you are saying, well, I cannot say no to my mother. I cannot say no to my people. They are the people that are bringing the thing. And they say I should rob it. That if I rob it, then I will have children. You are a backslider. If you get into that, because if we deny him, he also will do what? He will deny us. You hinder your own prayer. You hinder your miracle. And you hinder your getting into heaven. I pray you will not deny the Lord. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 6. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 6. For Christ as a son over his own house. Whose house we are. If we, if we hold fast the confidence and the, and the rejoicing of the hope. Firm unto the end, if we hold it fast, if we're not just, you know, falling and rising and, you know, kneeling and rising and whatever, but if we hold it fast until the very end, look at verse 14, for we are made partakers of Christ, if, that's the word again, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Hebrews chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 35. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. You see how the word if is all there in the Bible, all throughout Old Testament, in many verses. I cannot read everything to you in one study, but look at verse 35. Hebrews chapter 10, cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and it will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. How do we live? I said, how do you live? By faith. The just shall live by faith. 
But if any man draw back, if any man draw back, tell me the rest. My soul shall have no pleasure in him. If you draw back your private life at home, you've drawn back already into sin, into evil, into backsliding. Whatever you do, you can come over here and shout, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Raise your hand, scream, shout, pray, and be fervent. God says, I know, I know you. I know what you've done in the secret. If any man draw back, you draw back onto perdition, onto backsliding, onto sin, onto the vomit you left before. Anything you come to do here, it says, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. In verse 39, but we are not of them that draw back onto perdition. Am I talking about you? Yes. You are not of them that draw back. Yes. We will not draw back in Jesus' name. Yes. But we are of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Let's look at Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that means they were saved before. But now, after they have escaped the pollution, after they have escaped the dirt, the defilement, the uncleanness of sin, after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. They were saved, they were on their way to heaven, but now they go back again into those pollutions and evil things. It says the latter end of those people, except they come back to the Lord again, the latter end will be worse than the beginning. I pray that will not be you. Look at Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. I'm reading from verse, from verse 18. For I testify to every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, Tell me the next thing. If any man shall add unto these things. If any man shall add unto these things. Anybody coming to you and is saying he had a dream. And the dream is not according to the word of God. That's addition. He said, I have a vision. That's addition. I was in a trance, and then it's not according to the word of God. That's addition. I said, but the Bible says, but the Bible, it says, no, forget about that. I'm telling you that I have a vision. And the vision is saying this and this is adding to the word of God. And the Bible says, if any man, no matter the, who the man is, if, that's the word again. That's what we were teaching you here. The word of God from cover to cover, that if any man shall add, Unto the things which are written in this book, God shall add unto him, what? The plagues that are written in this book, verse 19. And what's the next word? If, if any man, God is no respecter of persons. Somebody cannot just come and say, well, I am an apostle and therefore I say, I say, shut up. The word of God has told us what to believe. Nobody comes here with an authority that is extra biblical. That's outside the Bible. And it is the word of God we are standing on. And you are going to stand on that word of God. And we are going to silence and shut up everyone that tries to add or subtract from the word of God here in Jesus name. We stand on the word because it's this word that leads us to life eternal. And don't want anybody to come and take away from the word that you're learning. In verse 19, if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. That's a man that has run in vain. He has preached in vain. He has labored in vain. He has fasted and prayed in vain. He has sacrificed and done everything in vain because he has taken away from the word of God and God says, I've removed his name out of the book of life. When somebody's name is out of the book of life, whatever else is preaching, whatever else is doing, whatever sacrifice, whatever testimony is giving and whatever vision, revelation is trying to say, I saw this, it's useless because the name is out of the book of life. That's why you need to be very watchful and careful that nobody will take this Bible away from your hand. Because if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city, 
Think about that. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And then he says, when I finish preparing that place, I'll come again and take you unto myself so that where I am, there ye will be also. But now if the man has taken away from the word of God, the Lord takes away his part, his name, out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testified this sin says, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The Lord is coming. When he comes, will he find you standing on totality of the word of God? Or will he find you taking this one away, adding this other one, taking that away, adding this one? Where will the Lord find you? He'll find you in the truth. He'll find you standing in the truth. He'll find you living by the truth in Jesus' name. And then what joy it will be at the set of sun when the Lord shall say, come, come on home. But understand that it is on condition that you continue to the very end. You will continue in Jesus' name. If I walk in the pathway of duty, if I walk to the close of the day, I shall see the king, the great king in his beauty when I've gone the last mile, although every mile of the way, you're keeping the totality of the word of God. You are not going astray and uh, you are not allowing anything to take the word of God away from you. And it says, if for Christ, I proclaim the glad story. If I seek for a sheep gone astray, I'm sure he will show me his glory when I've gone the last mile of the way. Here, the dearest of times was seven. There are people that want to kind of abandon the word and brainwash you and get you into evil and say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, I cannot go along with you. And we sever, we separate, we say, No, I cannot be your friend. If you are kind of putting the word of God and the doctrine of the Bible in the mud, I cannot stay with you. Here, the dearest of ties, we must sever. Tears of sorrow are seen every day when those people, when they abandon the faith, maybe somebody that brought you into the gospel, that brought you to the Lord, he has now abandoned the faith and is living a careless life, an adulterous life, and he'll say, I'm sorry. And he pains you to the very heart, and tears of sorrow will see that every day, but no sickness and sign forever when I've gone the last mile of the way. And if, that's the word again, if, if here I've honestly striven. I've tried all his will to obey. It will enhance all the rapture of heaven. When I've gone the last mile of the way, you'll get to the very end. When I've gone the last mile of the way, I will rest at the close of the day. There's no resting now. This is time for service. This time for preaching. This time for labor. Not laboring in vain. Laboring for fruit that will abide forever. I will know and I know there are joys that are with me, awaiting you. When I have gone the last mile of the way, when you have gone the last mile of the way, you'll be there. Yeah. Why don't you rise up and make a commitment to the Lord? You see that if, you see that if, you see that if, that you want to abide till the very end. You are saved, praise the Lord, don't look back. You are sanctified, praise the Lord, don't go back. You are filled with the Holy Ghost, praise the Lord, don't look back. You are serving the Lord and thank God for your service. Thank God for your ministry. Thank God for everything that you are doing. Thank God because you are standing in the faith. But keep on standing, keep on standing, keep on standing. Don't look back, don't go back, don't go back to perdition. Because it's if you continue till the very end, that's when the reward will come. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. And say, Lord, help me, Lord, help me, Lord, help me help me. I'll not stop my journey halfway. I'll not stop my journey at time of temptation, time of trial, time of pressure, time of persecution and time when other backsliders are coming to me and they've come to Seneca, demons, it's a Seneca. Coming to you and saying, are you still there? Are you still going to their Bible study? Are you still serving in that church? Are you still walking in that church? You're not going to allow them to, 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 to destroy your commitment and your faith. If I walk in the pathway of duty, if I walk till the close of the day, I shall see the great king in his beauty when I've gone the last mile of the way. You must endure till the end, endure till the end, endure till the end. That's what will bring the reward. That's what will make you to rejoice on that final day. That's what the Lord will look at and say, well done, well done. Come into the joy of the Lord your God. Because you continue till the very end of the way. If for Christ you proclaim the glad story. If you seek for a sheep gone astray. You bring them back into the fold. 
will bring them back out outside, away from that false doctrine, away from that pollution, away from all those idolatrous and adulterous lifestyle, away from that fornication, away from that alcohol, away from that evil sin. If you proclaim the glad story, if you seek for a sheep gone astray, bringing them back into the fold, bringing them back into the very center of the will and the word of the Lord, then you say, I am sure it will show you his glory when you've gone the last mile of the way. Don't die in the middle way. Don't, don't, don't give up. In the half journey, keep on. Keep on moving on. Keep on praying. Keep on preaching. Keep on teaching. Keep on living for righteousness. Keep on standing for the truth. Honestly, contending for the faith was delivered unto the saints. Move on. Move on. Don't look back. Don't stay there. Make progress. You're saved. Move on. Get sanctified. You're sanctified. Move on. And be filled with the Holy Ghost. You're energized, similar, empowered in the power of the Holy Ghost. Move on. Serve the Lord. Lay everything on the altar. And increase in the service of the Lord every day. Increase and keep on increasing. In faithfulness, in loyalty, in devotedness, in surrender, in yieldedness, in sacrifice, paying the price every day, bearing your cross and moving on and making progress. Don't look back. Here the dearest of, of ties we must sever. You'll do it yourself. You must do it. Any deceiver coming to you, sever your ties with them. Sever your closeness with them. Separate. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. And not allow any backslider to make you backslide. Those who are falling, they want other people to fall. Those who have gone astray, they want to pull other people, them to go astray. Those who are cold and lukewarm, they want other people to be cold and lukewarm with them. Those who are unfaithful, they want other people to be unfaithful with them. Those who are disloyal, they want other people to be disloyal with them. They'll come and talk to you instead of evangelizing for Christ, they'll be evangelizing for the devil. Instead of making people to stand, they want to influence you to fall. Here, the dearest of ties you must sever. They are pretending to be friends. Anybody wanting to backslide is not a friend. Anybody wanting you to give up the face, that's not a friend. Anybody wanting you to be lukewarm and cold, that's not a friend. An enemy of your soul. You sever your ties with them. Separate from them. Dearest of ties. Very close. Very intimate. Very precious. In the past, beloved. But the dearest of ties, you must sever. My cause sorrow, tears, pain. Tears of sorrow are seen every day. But that place we're going, heaven, glory land, promised land, paradise, no sickness, no sighing forever. But that's when we've gone the last mile of the way. If you hold the fort, if you keep standing, if you hold fast, then we leave purposefully and joyfully, excitedly, if you hold fast to the very end. And if here I have honestly striving, striving against the flesh, fighting against the world, fighting against Satan, fighting against this temptation, if here I have honestly striving, Honestly striving and defending the faith. Honestly contending the faith for, uh, for the faith was delivered unto the saints. Honestly, eagerly, wholeheartedly, with all my heart. If here I've asked as a striving, I've tried all his will to obey. 
not some. All is will. All is will. All is will to obey. You are not dodging the will of God. You are not running away from the will of God. If I've endeavored all his will to obey, it will enhance all the rapture of heaven when I have gone the last mile of the way. Keep on moving, keep on going, keep on serving the Lord until the end, until the end of the way. When I've gone the last mile of the way, when I've gone the last mile of the way, when I've gone the last mile of the way, I will rest at the close of the day. And I know there are joys that await me when I've gone the last mile of the way. I have the same heart like those Thessalonians had wanting to see Paul the Apostle to come and teach us more. Have the same mind that those Thessalonians had wanting to come and re-emphasize sound doctrine unto them. Rejoicing in the truth. Rejecting error. Abiding in the truth. Abandoning false doctrine. Have the same mind with those Thessalonians that you'll stand, stand firm, courageously, steadfastly in the truth, for the truth, by the truth, be a defender of the faith. They abandoned their idols. Thank God you have to. Thank God you have to. You have abandoned your idols. You abandoned all those people that say they are boyfriend, girlfriend, sim partners. Thank God you have abandoned them. And those Thessalonians did not go back to them. And thank God you are not going back. Reaffirm that consecration. Reaffirm that commitment. They didn't go back. You will not go back. They resisted the devil. He fled from them. Thank God you have the grace. You have the power to do the same. Resist the devil. The tempter. And he will flee from you. Remain in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Abide in the Lord. Get into heaven demands abiding. Get into heaven demands remaining in the kingdom. Abide in the truth. Remain in the truth. Live in the truth. Crucify the flesh. And let your spirit be strong, courageous, powerful, not a coward, not fearful, not timid. Stand. Stand for righteousness. You tell the Lord, I want to stand. All I need is grace. I want to stand. I want to remain. I want to abide. All I need is your grace. To do your will. To abide in your will. Lord, help me. Help me. Help me to stand. Not looking back. Not going back. It will help you. It help Enoch and those three hundred 
years, 365 years, that man remained abiding in the truth, walking in righteousness, and he lived a righteous, rapturable life. Righteous and rapturable life. And the Lord is coming. The rapture is about to take place. Be like Enoch. Righteous, rapturable. You strengthen your heart. You strengthen your will. It's trending your resolve to remain and abide in the Lord till the very end. The love of others may wax cold, not yours. Others may begin to wobble as if their legs are now getting lame. And they cannot walk the highway of holiness anymore. Not you. You'll be walking straight and walking firm, steadfast in the Lord. For now we live. If ye stand fast in the Lord. Keep standing. Don't allow the voice of the enemy, the voice of the tempter, and the seduction of the tempter to pull you away from where you stand. Abide in the Lord. Abide in his will. He's able to keep you from falling. Able to hold your hand. Able to strengthen you. Able to make you stand. For the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Believe. That's how you got saved. By faith. Believe. That's how you got sanctified. By faith. Believe. That's the only way you can stand. By faith. The just shall lay by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But you are not of them that draw back unto perdition. But of them who keep on believing until that glorious day. Keep standing. Keep believing. Keep looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. But for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despised the shame, and now is set, seated down on the right hand of majesty on high. Follow the Lord, follow the Lord, follow the Lord till the very end. And yours will be the reward on the final day. Yours will be the crown on the final day. Abide in him. Remain in him. Be faithful till the very end. And when the Lord shall come and the saints go marching in. Thank God you'll be there. Don't allow anything to stop you halfway before you reach the end of the journey. Keep on praying. Keep on believing. Keep on following the Lord. And yours will be the crown on that final day. He's able to keep you Able to keep you abiding, steadfast, living for him, laboring in his vineyard, 
and making sure that your labor is not in vain. And yours will be a reward on that final day. If you stand, as I stand, and we all stand together, standing and abiding in the Lord in the faith, you and I, all of us together, will see the Lord on the final day, and we'll see one another in glory land too. Keep on abiding.